this is an abandoned Newport mansion. Wait, ho hold on, no, that can't be right. Okay, this is an abandoned Newport mansion. Kind of. These are actually the remains of the stable house and garage that was built next to the mansion. But if this is just where the horses slept, just imagine what the actual house was like. Welcome to what remains of the abandoned Bells Estate. To understand and appreciate what we're looking at, I gotta take you way back to the Gilded Age in America. Let's just hop in my time machine here, which, yes, is a giant awful awful cup because, yeah, time travel makes me thirsty. And, yeah, maybe I want Newport Creamery to sponsor me. Anyway, let's go. The Gilded Age was an era from around 1870 to 1900. It was a time of rapid economic growth from industrial and technological advances, mainly in the northern and western United States. But it was also a time of straight up poverty and inequality as the wealth was highly concentrated at the top, with the workforce being paid barely a livable wage. From 1860 to 1900, the wealthiest 2% of American households owned more than a third of the nation's wealth. To put this in perspective, Today, the wealthiest 1% of Americans own a third of the nation's wealth. Oh man, that's even worse. Never mind. Let's get back to the Gilded Age. The phrase Gilded Age was coined by Mark Twain, who was making fun of the era. That it was a time of serious social problems masked by a thin gold gilding of economic expansion. It was materialistic excesses combined with extreme poverty. Some of the big names of the time include John Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and our boy for this story, lawyer-slash-businessman Theodore M. Davis, a man who accumulated his wealth allegedly through corruption and fraud. He was subject to three congressional investigations and was only found guilty of looking just like the guy from Jumanji. But Theodore Davis was best known for his excavations in Egypt's Valley of the Kings between 1902 and 1913. He made some pretty big discoveries that were frequently highlighted in articles from the New York Times. At least 20 of his digs involved important finds or enhancement of scientific knowledge about ancient Egypt. He financed digs with his own money and hired professional archaeologists, painters, and photographers. I highly recommend reading the book The Millionaire and the Mummies, Theodore Davis's Gilded Age in the Valley of the Kings, which gives a wicked history on this guy and his explorations. Before becoming a world-famous explorer, in 1882 he used his wealth to construct a mansion estate right on the ocean in Newport, Rhode Island. This was a big trend at the time, with other mansions being constructed in Newport like Sunset Ridge in 1877, Stoneacre in 1882, and Greystone in 1883. All of these mansions were built within five years of each other, and they're all gone today. Theodore Davis constructed what he called the Reef, a mansion built on 18 acres just a few hundred yards from the Atlantic Ocean. There isn't much left of the sprawling estate today, the carriage house being the biggest reminder, but we'll get to that in a bit. The property is shown here in this booklet created to sell the estate after Davis' death in 1915. It gives a rare glimpse into what the full estate used to look like under his ownership. It says that this spot was the land which he believed to be the choicest spot in Newport and built the house which he called the Reef, naming it from the famous Brenton's Reef, which runs far out into the ocean from the shore in front of his estate. And if you think the outside is nice, then uh, get a load of this. This is the main hall full of oak paneling where you could eat caviar and drink champagne. Here's the dining room with mahogany paneling where you can, I don't know, also eat caviar and drink champagne. Seriously though, here's the drawing room and you can really see how easy it would be to eat caviar and drink champagne in here. Outside you have what's listed as an open air playroom or as I like to call it, a yard. There's also a greenhouse and giant clematis covered trellis. There are only two pieces of the property still here today. First is the bungalow, shown in this photo where the servants' rooms and the laundry were. This building is still here and serves as the visitor center for the state park. Second is my favorite thing in the booklet, a photo and description of the stables and garage. Of the stables, the description says, fireproof, even to the steel doors, this building is most modern. It can house 10 or 12 machines and stable as many horses. On the second floor are rooms for about 10 men with their kitchen, dining, and resting rooms. The tower contains a clock with musical chimes.
The claim that it was fireproof really holds up, but otherwise, this place is toast. It's got the standard bando graffiti and has been completely overgrown. But it's still got the stables inside, probably the biggest clue as to what this giant crumbling building used to be. Okay everyone, say it with me. Why is this abandoned and where is the mansion? This is where the story gets annoying. Upon Davis's death in 1915, the house was purchased by Mr. and Mrs. Milton J. Budlong and renamed The Bells, which is how we know it today. During a difficult divorce dispute between the Budlongs in 1928, the home was placed in contention. Neither Budlong ever lived in the house again, though it eventually passed to Miss Frances Budlong. It was seized during World War II and gun battlements were installed to expand the fortifications at nearby Fort Wetherill, which is also abandoned today. As the war drew to a close, the property was returned to Miss Budlong, who continued to ignore the property, leaving it open to vandalism and decay. This photo from the 1950s shows it boarded up and abandoned, and is one of the last shots of the estate. In 1961, vandals set fire to the historic structure, burning the entire mansion to the ground, leaving only the carriage house and servants' quarters as a reminder of what used to be here. Today, the remains sit in a state park and are owned by the state of Rhode Island. Just like the windswept estate remains on Scarborough Beach, there are no plans to demolish these ruins. So, until it falls, these stables will sit quietly as another reminder of Newport's Gilded Age. interesting Rhode Island icons like this and learn about their history, you can check out the rest of my videos on my channel right now. Thank you very much for watching.